so I'm going to be uh, talking uh, about the, the methods of philosophy in these, these 10 uh, lectures. And of course, the, the methods uh, of philosophy um, are the, um, the, the ways uh, in which uh, philosophy uh, achieves uh, its aims. So um, in effect, the question that I'm going to be answering um, is, uh, at least partially, is how does philosophy achieve its aims? Um, I mean, obviously, that um, that question uh, has a, a presupposition. Um, it's uh, presupposing that uh, philosophy uh, can share its, uh, can achieve its aims. Um, and... Um, and that also uh, raises the the question uh, of uh, what um, what philosophy is and and what its aims are, uh, so that we can understand uh, how they are uh, related. Um, so I should say just something very briefly uh, about that. Um, I mean, the first thing to to say about the word uh, philosophy is that it's uh, used in in many ways. I mean, you, you, it's quite often here, um, for example, footballers talking about their philosophy of football or um, cooks talking about their philosophy of cooking and so on. And, um, and they can be much more than their general attitude uh, to it. And, um, and, I, you know, I think that the the application of the term philosophy has been um, subject to all kinds of uh, historical uh, contingencies, and um, I don't I don't think that uh, that we're going to find um, anything very useful in some kind of abstract uh, definition uh, of it. Um, I think the the definition is most likely to be uh, incorrect in one way or another, um, and um, and probably also ju just as much in need of in need of explanation as as the term philosophy itself. I I, th I think we have uh, some ability to to recognise what counts as uh, philosophy and. Uh, what does does not, but uh, and that's enough for us to to get started. I, I think as as we go on, uh, you'll see more of, about uh, how I uh, understand what uh, philosophy is. But uh, I I'm not proposing to give you uh, an exact definition, and I don't I don't think there is a good exact uh, definition of it. Um, but w I will give, just to orient uh, these lectures a bit, I'll, I'll give you some sense of the, the way I'm understanding it. So I'm, I'm understanding it as a, a science, but not a natural science. I mean, a natural, it's not a natural science in the way that physics and biology, for example, are natural sciences. Um, I, I think as, as these lectures go on, you, you will see better uh, just what I what I uh, mean by that, um, and <laughs> my view, um, which is a, a controversial one. Uh, sorry, I, I, somebody, somebody needs to mute their um, themselves. Uh, um, so, uh, I mean, my view is that sciences aim at knowledge um of, of course that's that's controversial um and again um as these lectures uh, go on i think how i'm understanding that will uh, will become clearer um and so i mean given those partial clarifications um the, the questions that I was raising before about um, how philosophy achieves, achieves its aims or whether it can become the questions of how uh, philosophy uh, achieves knowledge 
and indeed whether philosophy can uh, achieve knowledge. Um, and again, it, it will be the lectures themselves that uh, give my, my answer to those uh, questions. Um, so I'll just briefly mention what the topics of the um, lectures uh, will be uh, one by one. So in each of them is about philosophy in connection with something. And uh, so we've got philosophy and common sense, which is today, um, philosophy and uh, disagreement, which is will be the next lecture, philosophy and clarification, philosophy and thought experiments, philosophy and theory comparison, philosophy and logic, uh, philosophy and uh, the history of philosophy, its past, um, philosophy and its neighbors, by which I mean uh, its neighboring uh, disciplines. I mean, philosophy overlaps um, with, with many different um, other disciplines or, or, or has a common border with them. Um, and then philosophy and models and philosophy and its future, the future of philosophy. Um, so in, in this lecture, I, I'm start with the question of where um, philosophy uh, starts. Um, and um, by, I mean, that one could understand two different questions. I mean, what one is where uh, philosophy starts for a, a particular uh, individual, and um, and the other is uh, where philosophy uh, starts for a whole uh, culture. Um, so, if we're talking about um, an an individual, um, they may become aware of philosophy as philosophy uh, through being introduced uh, to it by uh, by others, for example, by teachers or friends, um, to so, as a some sort of philosophical uh, tradition which they can uh, in some way uh, participate in or at least find find out about. Um, but th that seems, as it were, a, a little bit late uh, in a sense because uh, it seems a quite a natural idea that um, that many many children. Um, spontaneously ask uh, questions which some, somehow are, are already have some kind of philosophical uh, character to them. Um, and of, of course, um, well, in, in English, the, these questions are typically of the form, why this or why, why that? And I mean, there's uh, a stage at which uh, children ask these why questions uh, about uh, almost um, everything. Um, I mean, I've I've heard a child on the bus asking their parent where the bus went to, and being told it go, goes to Clapham, and then the child asking why. And and, um, and of course, I mean that's not a spe an especially philosophical uh, question. But um, but but many of these why questions that children ask uh, do have some kind of philosophical. Uh, character to them, um, and and in fact, uh, it, it, it's been said that uh, that all normal human beings go through a, a phase of asking uh, why questions, and um, most most people uh, grow out of that. Um, but um, but some some people never do, and the ones who never do grow out, grow out of that faith are, are the philosophers. Um, so I I want to suggest that as well this that philosophy is something that uh, we can um, get to quite naturally with without having. In some, at least in some form, without having contact with a philosophical 
uh, tradition. And, and part of what I'm going to talk about in this first lecture um, is um, what uh, sort of cognitive basis um, philosophy uh, needs to get started. What kind of cognitive equipment do we need to have um, to, to do some philosophy? I mean, to get, as it were, to get beyond merely asking the, these uh, why questions or what questions or uh, whatever they happen uh, to be. Um, and, and so I think a, a natural uh, answer to that question might be that uh, that philosophy uh, starts um, with with common sense, um, with something that is widely shared, not not with some special, um, unusual characteristic of the the individual, um, and and so I I'm going to explain how I'm understanding uh, common sense uh, here. Um, so when I describe something as common sense, I'm, I'm not implying that it's um, universal to all human beings or all normal human beings or something like that. Um, I'm, I, I'm quite um, content uh, for common sense to be something which uh, varies um, with uh, the, the individual's uh, social group and uh, also with their uh, historical uh, period. So that well, what's common sense uh, in one group may not be common sense in another and what's common sense at one time may not be common sense at another time. Um, and in in particular, what I mean by common sense knowledge is simply widely shared knowledge in that relevant group. And and so um, just some random uh, examples of common sense knowledge and uh, knowledge that uh, rice is edible, that it can be eaten, um, knowledge that cats are not dogs. Um, knowledge that there are mountains uh, in China and uh, knowledge of what common words mean. So um, with the knowledge that rice is edible, that cats are not dogs, that there are mountains in China, these are, these are very, this knowledge is very widespread in many communities, but it's, it's not a human universal because some groups of humans have, have never encountered uh, rice, so they don't, and and some have never encountered cats or dogs, um, and some have never heard of uh, China. Maybe not so uh, so many these days but who have never heard of these things, but uh, but in the past there were there were many groups like that. Um, and uh, knowledge of what common words mean, uh, of course, the the particular knowledge um, that's in question here is knowledge of what particular words mean and so that depends on uh what what language you you happen to uh to speak or to understand which uh, of course varies very much from one uh community to another i mean of course it's it's common to human beings to to have knowledge of what the words of their own language uh mean i mean that's that's almost I mean, pretty much a human universal of at least amongst all normal humans but um, but the particular knowledge that makes it up varies according to the, the language. Um, but I don't want to uh, combine, uh, to confine uh, common sense to knowledge. I also want to have um, a notion of common sense uh, belief, um, by which I mean uh, similarly widely shared belief in the relevant community. Um, and so... Um, in ancient times, I assume that the belief that the earth was flat uh, was a common sense belief. It was widely shared. And um, I mean, if you uh, if you have a religious uh, society, then uh, a society, let's say, dominated by by one religion in particular, then the uh, beliefs associated 
with that religion will uh, will count as uh, common sense uh, beliefs within that that religious society. Um, and and I also want to um, extend the notion of common sense uh, to to cognitive methods. Um, and in the same way as before, so cognitive uh, I mean, methods, uh, common sense methods, if if they're widely shared in the relevant community, and I, to talk at a, a fairly uh, generic uh, level, um, the I mean the kind of examples we might think of are our sense perception, uh, which is a, a method for acquiring knowledge or belief, memory as a method for preserving uh, knowledge or belief, and testimony um, as a method for um, communicating knowledge or belief to other people. Um, and by the way, uh, notice that although sense perception is a common sense method, the the particular knowledge or belief that we get by sense perception often won't count as common sense by the defin that, definition that I gave because, um, for example, when um, when I look around, I, I I get knowledge about where the objects on my desk uh, are um, and by sense perception. But if I, but since I'm not sharing that knowledge with anyone else, it's it, it that knowledge is not itself uh, common sense knowledge, although it's acquired by a common sense uh, means. Um, and so I, I, I've defined common sense in this way as in order to avoid um, making contentious assumptions here. So I'm I'm allowing that common sense beliefs uh, can be uh, false. Uh, so common sense in that way is, is fallible. Um, of course, uh, common sense knowledge can't be false because uh, it's just a part of the nature of knowledge that whatever is known uh, is true. Um, but but that's, uh, that as we're guarantee of truth is, coming from the fact that it's knowledge. It's not coming from the fact that it's common sense. Um, and so, um, well, we've already had some examples of um, false common sense beliefs. So, so talking about some ancient community, um, the, the false uh, common sense uh, belief that the earth was flat, um, that it was common sense because it was widely shared, even though it was false, but it was not a common sense knowledge because it wasn't uh, knowledge at all. Um, of course, the the people in that ancient community um, might have have thought uh, that, uh, it, I mean, it might have been a, that uh, they had, it was common sense knowledge that the earth was flat, but they were wrong about that. I mean, it, and if they all thought that, then that was a, a false, another false common sense belief about the epistemological status of their uh, belief that the earth was uh, was flat. Um, I, I sh should just say, uh, people sometimes challenge this assumption that, uh, that knowledge uh, has to be, uh, true, uh, but I think the the kind of examples that people sometimes use against that uh, assumption uh, are based on a misunderstanding of uh, of quite a common way that we use uh, language. Um, so, I mean, you might hear somebody saying something like. Uh, of course, in ancient times, people knew that the the earth was flat. Um, but I think what they're doing when they say that is using words, uh, in particular the word no uh, or new, um, in a kind of projective way where um, they're putting things as the people that they're 
talking about uh, would would put them. Um, and that kind of projective use is very, very common. It's, um, so it, the, since the people um, in the ancient community, they, they thought they knew that the earth was flat. And so um, we're, as we're, we're using the term no projectively to describe their point of view. But um, this, is, this is something that you can do with more or less, um, you know, any, um, any word. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, um, you know, if I'm describing um, a, a meal, I, you know, I could say something like I, um, I, I saw a, a glass of water and, um, and had a drink from it. And then suddenly I realized that it wasn't water. It was, um, it was whiskey or something. Um, and so that's a projective use of the, uh, of the word water uh, being applied to whiskey. And it was, it, it's projective because the, at the time, I, I thought that it was uh, water, even though it wasn't. It, that's not a, 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 some kind of ambiguity in the word water. It's simply the fact that we can use the word water projectively. And uh, we sometimes use the word knowledge uh, projectively. And that can give um, the uh, appearance, if, it's, if the phenomenon is misinterpreted, the appearance that there's such a thing as false knowledge. But, but as I say, that's just a mis misinterpretation of uh, projective uses of language. Um, so now, I, having given that kind of sketch of how I'm understanding um, common sense, I, I want to discuss uh, its relation to uh, philosophy. Um, so, I'm not suggesting that everyone with lots of common sense knowledge and belief is a philosopher, e even in a sort of relatively loose and uh, informal sense. I mean, somebody can have lots of common sense knowledge and belief just by um, having a lot, a, a quite a lot of just very normal awareness uh, of their. Uh, natural and and social world while not being uh, at all uh, reflective uh, on it and um, and so as we we need something a bit more than just common sense to get uh, philosophy uh, started and and I think the the natural answer to the question of uh, what more we need uh, is is curiosity. Um, by curiosity, I mean the appetite uh, for knowledge. Um, so I, I, I should just say something quickly about why I, I use a slightly unusual um, term appetite rather than just calling it a, a desire or, or a want. Um, the reason for that is that... that um, Describing it as a desire um, implies that the, the the person who has the desire it, is, if it's a desire for knowledge, they're, they're thinking of it as knowledge. Um, so, as, as it were, it, it's as if they were thinking, "I'd like some, uh, I'd like some knowledge," um, and um, I, I think that's over intellectualizing uh, what uh, curiosity is. And as you see, I, I, I'm, I think that uh, curiosity is uh, a feature which, which very young children before they have any language um, have and, and which non-human animals have. And those non-human animals, they might not have any, as it were, um, conception of knowledge but they but they still have an appetite for it they're still as it were disposed to do things to acquire uh, knowledge um, and in the same way as you know, they might have an appetite for food and drink but without 
necessarily uh, as it were characterizing what it is they want as food uh, or drink. Um, so in, in describing it as an appetite for, for knowledge, I'm, I'm not implying anything especially intellectual or, or reflective on the part of the, the curious um, agent. Um, so humans typically express uh, curiosity by asking questions. For example, what is this in front of me? Um, but as I've just uh, emphasized, the ability to express one's curiosity in language is not essential for curiosity itself. So very young children and many species of non-human animals uh, can be curious. I think uh, cats and dogs, for example, are pretty obviously uh, curious animals. I mean, if you just have to uh, watch them sniffing about to um, to see uh, how curious they are. Um, and I don't think this is some kind of weird, as it were, philosopher's uh, projection of, of philosophical interests onto languageless animals. It, it's rather that this is something that's not at all surprising from an ordinary evolutionary uh, perspective. Um, and I mean, the point, the point is that it's, it's often not clear in advance what sorts of knowledge will come in useful. Um, so it, it, creatures who know, you know, a lot about their environment, they, they for example, they, they have a kind of map of uh, their local environment and where things are and how to get from one part of it to another and so on. And maybe who, who also have quite a bit of knowledge about other members of uh, whatever group or pact they, they belong to. Um, they can use that knowledge to react uh, quickly and appropriately to dangers and uh, opportunities. Um, so, for example, I mean, the, the, you know, they will be be able to uh, know um, where other members of their group are and where the members of other species are, maybe members who, that they might eat, of, of another species that they might eat or that might eat them and so on. And, um, and they, it's to their advantage um, not, not to have to find these things out once it, it becomes the knowledge becomes of practical use. It's, be it's much better and quicker and more efficient and perhaps life-saving if you already have that uh, knowledge uh, available. And that's, that's really very closely related to what one might think of as the evolutionary advantage of uh, having a mind at all. Uh, because, I mean, presumably in, in very rough, uh, terms, the the advantage uh, of having uh, a mind is that it enables uh, one to adapt uh, one's uh, behavior to new circumstances in some kind of complex and unpredictable uh, world, uh, and and so as where the point of having uh, knowledge is that one acts on it to act, uh, one acts on it um, in appropriate ways. And, and so getting, getting that knowledge in uh, advance, uh, as were before, before things become urgent or an emergency, uh, ha has obvious um, survival value. Um, so Th that's that's why it, it's completely unsurprising that um, curiosity as the appetite for knowledge is widespread in the animal uh, world, uh, including amongst lots of animals that, that don't uh, have uh, language. But for creatures who do have language, uh, the language enables us to uh, construct more abstract questions um, to and to construct them and to ask them 
And, and so it, it enables us to uh, become curious about more abstract matters, uh, which we couldn't really mentally engage with uh, if we didn't uh, have something like uh, a language uh, to do it in. Um, now, of these somewhat more um, abstract uh, questions that we can that we can ask, um, some are proto scientific. It, in other words, they seem to be taking a, a step in the direction of a, a scientific in, interest in the world. Um, and I, I mean, just to take some random examples uh, that occurred to me, the, I mean, these could be questions like, uh, what is water? What is earth? What is air? What is fire? What is light? What are things made of? Um, maybe what makes some, some things good to eat or drink and others bad? Uh, what makes things uh, uh, fall down, uh, not up? So th these, these are questions which, once you have the words to ask them with, um, and you have some kind of curiosity, um, it's it's very easy to ask, and um, th these are questions which you know might well re occur to a child to ask. A child might ask questions like this uh, of its parents. Um, But there are also uh, questions which are proto-philosophical um, in the sense that asking them seems to be taking a step uh, towards uh, philosophy. Um, so, so, for example, you know, you might ask, are there things we can't see? Um, Perhaps even a little bit more abstractly, other things which can't be seen, um, which could just be a question. Of, I mean, concerning things too small to be seen, for example, but it could also lead to reflections on something like, for example, whether whether numbers can be seen, um, and um, you, you could ask questions like. Uh, what is space, what is time, what is life, what is death, what makes the difference between waking and sleeping, what makes the difference between seeing and imagining, what makes the difference between knowing and thinking, what makes some things good and others bad, or what is uh, fairness. And these are really questions which, you know, it would be po possible for uh, a child to ask, and I'm, I expect that um, some children have asked these questions, um, and and they they all seem to be questions which um, are at least on a road that leads to philosophy. There's a, a, there's a, already something like a a, uh, a philosophical uh, character uh, to them, um, and one observation to to make about this is that although I've uh, separated uh, those questions into two lists, one of uh, the um, proto-scientific questions and um, one of the proto-philosophical ones, um, I, I don't think that someone just naively asking those questions would be likely to be aware of any a very systematic uh, difference between those two. I mean, I don't, I doubt that they would think of them as uh, different kinds of question. Um, that they, they feel as though they're, they're all of uh, the same, rather broad uh, sort. And uh, in, in fact, um, I mean, there are a lot of questions which could easily appear on both. Lists. I mean, for example, the question "What is time?" Uh, is a question which uh, has certainly been uh, asked uh, within uh, philosophy, but it's also a question uh, which 
um, which physicists are, are legitimately interested uh, in. And, um, and I don't think that, uh, at, at least in, in as were the early stages of, of this sort of inquiry, that, that, there's, that there's somehow they mean different things um, by the, these, these questions. So that it's broadly the same question be, being asked either in, in a philosophical context or, or a scientific, I mean, natural scientific one. Um, and then something that I, I just want to, to mention here, although uh, it, it's real um, significance will, will become uh, more um, obvious in some of the later lectures, that you know, if, if somebody has the idea that, that philosophical questions are somehow conceptual, whereas scientific questions are uh, empirical, um, it's completely unnatural to, to try to classify the, those questions which I've listed as some of them as empirical and other ones as uh, conceptual. Uh, I mean, for example, um, you know, it, it, it's completely unnatural to think that, that the, the question, what is time, as it might be asked in this naive way, could be a question about the concept of time or the, or the word time or anything like that. Um, it seems that, as it were, whether we think of it as a proto-philosophical or a proto-scientific question, it's naturally understood as a question about time itself, not about the concept of time or about the experience of time, but time itself. Um, so that at least when we look at the origins of um, philosophy and science in this sort of uh, common sense curiosity. There's there's no basis for distinguishing between um, empirical proto scientific questions and conceptual proto philosophical ones. That that distinction just uh, um, is completely inappropriate for for these kind of uh, questions. Another point that I want to uh, to bring out um, is that if we imagine Stone Age people trying to answer those questions, or for that matter, young children trying to answer them, um, what do they have to go on? Well, nothing really very much except uh, common sense knowledge or belief, and maybe common sense methods uh, as well. Um, but it also doesn't seem that common sense knowledge or um, belief and common sense methods are, are very likely to take them far in answering those uh, questions. Um, and, and one feature of curiosity is that it can drive us to ask questions even when we have no idea how to go about uh, answering them. For example, I think people were asking the question, what is time, long before they had any real uh, idea of what might be an appropriate method for answering that question. I mean, they, they were um, asking it in a way because the, they were in the habit of asking questions, and the and the, the the language that they possessed enabled them to to formulate it. Um, and and I think that's important because um, you sometimes see metaphysics. And, and as it were, more metaphysical or theoretical ways of doing philosophy are uh, criticized on the basis that people are asking questions without really any idea how to answer them. And I don't think we should regard that kind of uh, curiosity as such a bad uh, thing, because uh, after all, you know, if we think there's something worthwhile about about natural science, 
uh, I take it that natural science was rooted in curiosity-driven questions, which when they were first asked, people had no idea how to answer. But by asking them, they, they provided motivation to find ways of answering them. And uh, in the long run, of course, th th um, that has led them to answers to, to many of those uh, questions. And, and in fact, those were some of, in a way, the best questions that human beings have ever asked. Uh, so, so that the, the fact that we, that we don't really know how to answer at least many of these questions it is not a reason for um, not asking them. It's a reason for, for seeking methods that will help us to answer them. So th those are some remarks about um, the relation um, between common sense and, um, and how philosophy starts. Uh, but obviously, uh, the fact that philosophy may start with common sense, as 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 we're all we have uh, to answer these uh, questions, that uh, that doesn't mean that it also uh, has to end with common sense. Um, and well, the obvious comparison is with science uh, itself, which um, I think, like philosophy and in a way, in perhaps the very same um, series of developments, started with uh, com common sense and with curiosity-driven questions. Uh, but certainly science uh, goes way beyond uh, common sense. And, um, and scientific uh, theories um, often end, end up coming to conclusions which seem to be violations of common sense. Um, for example, with quantum mechanics and um, and special relativity. Um, so the question I now want to to turn to is um, what role, if um, any, common sense has in philosophy as it develops beyond its start, whether common sense has a continuing role in philosophy. Um, so, I mean, one line of thought is that common sense has a very important uh, role, uh, e even once philosophy has already got started, and, and perhaps a role that uh, that it should never stop playing, and that is, um, it seems like a good way to stop philosophy going crazy. Um, so, just to take an example of the kind of philosophical theory which is a a violation of uh, common sense. Um, I mean, take a, a philosophical theory which implies that everything except fundamental physics is an illusion. I mean, that's a, a, a view which, uh, you know, quite a, a number of uh, philosophers seem to, to have, and typically philosophers who describe themselves as naturalists of, of, of a fairly hardline kind. Um, and the fact that that's a theory like that is ringing alarm bells with uh, common sense um, may be alerting us to something um, that uh, is is genuine, genuinely problematic about a theory like uh, that. Um, so, after all. The, I mean, the, the the idea of an illusion is is not itself part of a, 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 some fundamental physical theory. We, I mean, they don't talk about illusions because they, they uh, because illusions have to do with things appearing other than they are, and and the uh, fundamental physics doesn't talk about that because of that uh, the, the idea of an illusion requires um, some kind of um, 
mind that is the victim uh, of the illusion and fundamental physics doesn't talk about that. So that there might in the end be something um, self-defeating uh, about um, extreme theories of that. And it's something that, um, that common sense alerts us to. Um, and, and it may also be playing this kind of uh, role uh, in natural science to some extent. So, I mean, there's something problematic about a theory of physics, for, let's say, which implies that there are no observers. Um, because the danger is that such a theory of, of physics um, is undermining uh, it, itself uh, by um, apparently being inconsistent with the possibility of the observational uh, evidence uh, that it's supposed to be based on. And of course, uh, observational evidence itself um, relies on ways of level. It relies on uh, sense perception, ultimately. Um, and and so it, it's, it seems like a natural thought that, um, that as it were, we never completely grow out of uh, common sense um, because uh, we st we need it as a a check to stop our theories uh, losing all touch with with reality. Um, but at the same time, uh, th there are some very obvious uh, worries about uh, that view, uh, and this goes back to the um, the point that I was making uh, earlier that. Um, that some some common sense uh, beliefs are false, um, and and so as where we, I mean that suggests the reflection. Well, we're not we're not safe in relying on on common sense because it uh, it can lead us into error, and and we might have the um, the worry that um, that common sense. Um, more much more generally just consists of out of date uh prejudices i mean bertrand russell is supposed to have described it as um common sense as the, the metaphysics of savages um and then it, if we're using uh common sense as a check on philosophical or scientific theories so that we reject those which are inconsistent with common sense then the danger is that we never escape from those prejudices because um, the methodological role of common sense would mean that um, that it's excluding theories which reject uh, common sense. Um, and, and this kind of concern also goes uh, with, the, with the thought that perhaps common sense beliefs are useful but not true. Um, that uh, they that they help us uh, get through life uh, in in some way, um, but but that the fact that they're useful doesn't doesn't entail that that they're true. And of course, uh, um, the idea of a belief that is useful but not true. I mean, is that's a, a genuine uh, possibility. And, and perhaps one example is that um, it may. It may be useful for people to to somewhat <coughs> over, overestimate themselves, to uh, to believe that they're cleverer and more popular and so on than they really are, um, because th those those kind of over optimistic uh, beliefs about themselves um, are motivating and. <coughs> And keep people uh, happy and and um, make them more likely to succeed. If, I mean, the, if you, you're self confident, that then you're more likely to to get away with things and um, and so on. So that I mean, it certainly is possible to have beliefs which are useful but not true. Um, and then, of course, this the kind of worry that that it's not unnatural to have about common sense is that maybe that's the situation with common sense much more generally. Um, and, and then the, the thought 
I mean, the question occurs to us, well, if we can't rely on common sense, what evidence can we use to support our theories in science and philosophy? If, if common sense isn't a source of evidence, what, what is? Um, and I think there's a, a, a popular and very uh, widespread answer to that, um, which is something like this, that um, your evidence uh, just consists of appearances to you. So, for example, suppose you've done some experiment um, in which well, maybe um, the uh, some let's say some metal rod are uh, expanded. Um, then, on this view of, that your evidence just consists of appearances, um, your evidence does not <coughs> include the fact that that this rod are expanded. Your evidence only includes the fact that it appeared to you that are expanded. And, and so the thing is whether, whether uh, it, it did or did not expand, it, at least it, it appeared to you that it expanded. And that's um, why the, the evidence that you have just concerns the appearance. Um, and if we develop this view just a little bit, um, what it suggests is that theories um, just have to uh, preserve the appearances. In, in other words, uh, well, at best to explain why things appear in that way, for example, why the rod appeared to expand, or at least, um, even if they don't explain them, at least be consistent with, with their appearing that way. But it, it says that theories do not also have to vindicate the appearances in the sense of explaining why things really are that way, uh, the, the way they appear. For example, explaining why um, Rod uh, uh, did expand, because maybe it didn't, or maybe it only appeared to. Um, or even if they don't, I mean, then and explain it, um, there is not even a requirement on this view that theories are at least consistent with uh, things really being the way that they appear. They, theories can simply deny that things are the way they appear. And uh, I mean, the underlying uh, motivation for this view is that we are fallible about whether things are the way they appear to us, but we're not fallible about whether they appear to us that way. I mean, that's, that's the advantage that these appearances are supposed to have, that um, we're not fallible in the way, it, um, we're not fallible about them in the way that we're fallible about, as well, the reality that um, their appearances of. Um, now, If if that motivation is right, what it's what it's requiring is um, that we have infallible sources of uh, evidence, uh, sources which can't present us at, with anything that's false as as evidence, um, because as well, these facts about appearances are um, are still going to be true, even if the appearances themselves are illusory. Um, and what I briefly want to do is to uh, explain uh, the problem for that view of um, evidence. And, and the, the main problem for it is that the motivation for the view fails because um, because we're fallible about appearances too. And uh, there are at least three aspects to that uh, fallibility, uh, maybe more. But um, so the the first kind of fallibility concerning appearances is, is this that. 
pretty obviously I am fallible about appearances to you and you are fallible about appearances uh, to me, which uh, we can call the problem of communication. Um, and I mean, this is pretty obvious because um, when I rely on how things appear to you i'm typically i'm doing that on the basis of your testimony you're, you're telling me how things appear to you and of course um you could be lying about that um and the thing is if we just if each inquirer just relies on appearances to them and ignores appearances to everyone else then that is not sufficient for um, for anything like uh, science or even philosophy, um, because science and philosophy are um, intersubjective disciplines. Uh, the, so that the the results that we're we're getting, I mean, they they've got to be uh, available, and the kind of the case for them uh, has got to be. Um, available to others as well as uh, oneself, um, and uh, and so it's it's not it's not enough um, that that you have the evidence uh, for a theory. It's got to be that that, uh, that it's evidence which is available to other people as well. Um, and in fact, you, I mean, if you think about. Uh, the evidence for scientific hypotheses, which is presented in, uh, for example, articles in scientific journals, uh, it, it's not um, a reports on how things appeared to a particular individual. It's, like, it's just reports actually on, on what the, the results of the experiment were and that sort of thing. Um, the, I mean, the second kind of fallibility um, of appearances is that we're fallible about past appearances, which is the problem of memory. Um, so I'm I'm certainly uh, fallible about uh, how things appeared to me yesterday because I might be misremembering. There's, I mean, there's absolutely no infallibility uh, there. Um, and and so if one was tr as we're trying to um, restrict the evidence to a domain where appearances are, are um, or facts about appearances which are in, in by which we're infallible, uh, we just have to restrict ourselves to present appearances. Um, but present appearances are far too little uh, for um, science or, or philosophy because uh, they don't allow the accumulation of of evidence in the way that we need it uh, for any kind of uh, systematic inquiry to proceed. Uh, because we, as well, as soon as if if we only had our present appearances, as, as soon as uh, a couple of seconds had gone by, we would have lost them again. Um, so th th those are two pretty obvious aspects of of uh, the fallibility of appearances and, um, or of, I mean, our, fa our fallibility about appearances. Um, and, um, and so they already suggest that we would have to restrict ourselves to, to facts, uh, or a, a given agent would have to respect, restrict themselves to facts about uh, how things appear to them at that very time, which is an, a, a extraordinary restriction of evidence, but there's even a further problem of uh, fallibility uh, with uh, evidence, um, which is that we're fallible even about present appearances to ourselves, and we could just to give it a name, we could call it the problem of introspection, because if we're going to use uh, appearances as evidence, um, which we can used to confront a theory, uh, we're going to have to describe them in language because the assessment of theories against evidence normally takes place in language. Um, but if we can describe them in language, we can also misdescribe them. Um, 
and and so as once appearances as were well are articulated in words in the way that they need to be because science and philosophy are verbalized uh we're no longer uh infallible about them i mean i think in fact the infallibility might go even further than this but but those are three fairly clear ways uh in which um appearances um do not constitute a, a, an infallible uh source of of evidence um and so i think the the natural moral to to draw here is uh not just that uh appearances are not this uniquely evidence but they just are no infallible sources of evidence that any potential source of evidence is also capable of producing uh falsehoods um and and so we should not be embarking on some kind of hopeless search for infallible sources of evidence because i think appearances are the uh, they're the best shot at um such uh evidence um but but we've seen that we're not infallible about about them and um that instead of looking for infallible sources of evidence which we will never find what we should do is concentrate on cultivating the ability to recognize our mistakes um and in in particular cases where we've incorrectly treated something as part of our evidence um and and so we we accept that it's inevitable that we'll sometimes make mistakes and what we have to do is to to be ready um to to correct the mistakes afterwards that's that's where the methodology needs to to come in not so much in excluding the possibility of error in the uh original uh assemblage of evidence but but in in being able to correct correct things when we have made mistakes we would just accept that we're always going to make some mistakes um now we we have to be careful here about um what kind of recognition of our fallibility and willingness to um accept our mistakes what what that involves um what it does not mean is that as, as soon as someone challenges something we've been using as evidence we stop using it as evidence um so it's it's not as um as though as whenever you're taking something as evidence and then um somebody asks are you sure or what's what's the reason for accepting that or whatever uh that that we then immediately have to stop treating whatever it was as evidence uh because if we adopted that policy it would be very easy for a skeptic to bring science to a complete halt simply by just challenging all our evidence because you know if if we had to stop relying on on um something as soon as it was challenged and if all our evidence was challenged then we'd have not we'd have nothing to rely on um and uh, and so the, the as well the appropriate kind of um readiness to recognize and correct our mistakes has to do with how we react when there are specific and serious doubts about it uh, so that as where they're not it's not just some kind of generic how do you know uh but but where a particular objection is uh is made to the sort of the thing that we've been relying on and then the, the, those doubts themselves are going to be based on some kind of uh evidence um and and so um they they can't work in a way which where we just um exclude everything from our our, our set of evidence and what i'm briefly going to do is 
uh, to to sketch very quickly the um, the view of evidence that I defend uh, in knowledge and its uh, limits, because I think this is in fact relevant to uh, evidence in philosophy. Um, so the, the the view that I defend is summarized in the equation uh, E equals K, where E stands for evidence and K stands for knowledge. And so the equation is understood as saying that the total content of your evidence is the total content of your knowledge. As well, what your evidence is, is what you know. And uh, one consequence of this, which I've been kind of um, it, hinting at in the way I've been formulating things before, but I haven't yet made explicit, uh, is that since knowledge is always true, uh, evidence is always true. Um, so you can think of evidence here as uh, consisting of facts. Um, and uh, so strictly speaking, there's no such thing as false evidence on this view. Um, but, and so you might think, well, in, in that case, how, how, does, how does fallibility uh, enter? But the, the fallibility is um, in what we identify as being part of our evidence. Um, and so in cases where we think we know things, which in fact we don't know, um, then given the, the equation e equals k, in effect what we're doing is wrongly thinking that these things are part of our evidence uh, when in fact they're not. Um, and so, um, I mean, so these are cases where we, we don't know something, but we don't know that we don't know it. Um, and, um, and those are also cases where something is not part of our evidence, but we don't know that it's, it's not part of our evidence. Um, there are also arguably cases where something um, is part of our evidence, but we don't know that it is. These, these correspond to cases where we know something, but we don't know that we know it. But that's, that's a much subtler issue. And um, the, the, the cases where something is not part of our evidence, maybe because it's false, um, those are the easiest um, ones to, to think about. Um, so given this equation e equals k, uh, everything we know is available for use as evidence in uh, philosophy. Uh, and that includes both uh, common sense knowledge and uh, scientific uh, knowledge. So uh, from the point of view of evidence, it's not that common sense knowledge has any special uh, privilege. It's simply that uh, because it's knowledge, it, it's a source of uh, evidence. Uh, but we can use any kind of uh, scientific knowledge that we have as uh, as evidence uh, too. Um, so, so this is a a view on which uh, philosophy is um, is not the um, prior to to um, scientific in investigation. It it can. Uh, it, can learn from scientific uh, investigation while while still uh, being philosophy. Um, so, I, but I, because I this this lecture is a, is particularly about the role of common sense, I want to say um, uh, something uh, about, in particular, the common sense uh, evidence. Um, I think somebody needs to turn off their uh, uh, to mute. To mute um, by the way, um, so the, yeah, I think could, could we have that muted, please. Um, so common. So remember that that common sense knowledge was initially was rejected as a source of. Uh, evidence uh, because it's uh, a fallible source because it can sometimes give us falsehoods. 
Um, but but now we've seen that uh, that's an unreasonable standard to apply to sources of evidence, and so uh, we can we can go uh, back to treating common sense as a source of evidence, and and that's. Uh, vindicated by the identification of evidence with what we know, because common sense is a source uh, of knowledge, at least let's assume that for the time being. Um, so, um, so common sense knowledge, it includes knowledge by perception, preserved by memory and communicated by um, testimony and any kind of knowledge that we have of that kind is in principle, something that we can use uh, in philosophy, although in the kind of critical way that I've been uh, describing. Um, and there may well be other kinds uh, of common sense knowledge which are acquired by, by common sense uh, reasoning, and that, that's something that I'll uh, discuss in lecture four, but for the time being we don't need to uh, decide that uh, issue. Um, so we st I think we still ha have to address these doubts um, about uh, about common sense uh, because because um, you, you might think that we're being too optimistic about common sense as a source of knowledge because we're biased uh, in our own uh, favor. Um, and you know, if you notice that I said that the fact that that common sense uh, is fallible doesn't exclude it as a source of evidence. And on the the view of evidence that we're now working with, um, common sense can provide evidence, provided that it uh, su supplies us with knowledge. But you remember earlier we were considering um, more skeptical views of common sense on which it might just turn out to be a bundle of prejudices or it might somehow radically um, misconceive the world. And, and then if, if, if all that it's supplying us with is, basic, is false, um, then uh, it is, it's not knowledge. And so after all, common sense will still not be uh, a source of evidence if it's not a source of knowledge. Um, so I think a lot of the, the, this kind of um, skeptical concern um, Is, is motivated, at least in part, by a, a fear that, that, we're, that we are biased in our own favour um, and that uh, the, the assumption that common sense provides us with a lot of uh, knowledge is, uh, as were, the kind of over optimistic uh, view that might be part of common sense and might be useful, but without being true. Because remember earlier, I was saying that that one example of beliefs that uh, that can be useful without being true are beliefs of an over optimistic uh, kind. I mean, you know, it's said that um, the only people uh, who or the people who accurately estimate what uh, what others uh, think of the, them are those who are clinically depressed. Um, that the rest of us who aren't clinically, uh, not clinically depressed, uh, overestimate how how much other people like us and respect us and so on. Um, and uh, and so it could be that that the uh, overestimation of common sense is itself part of of that um, as over optimistic, useful but not true uh, conception and i think that the the natural uh, way of uh dealing with this issue is um by by thinking of um animal uh common sense 
um, which again would, would would mean the the kinds of um, knowledge or beliefs that are widespread in uh, groups of animals. Of course, um, some of the things that I've been saying about common sense don't apply to animals uh, without uh, without language. Uh, so, for example. Um, the knowledge by testimony, but by it's communicated from one animal to another. There's there's not much of that if you don't have a language. I mean, maybe um, there's a little bit of that amongst uh, languageless animals because they have um, alarm cries and and so on. And bees communicate something by their dancing, but that's a, a much much less of a of a phenomenon that, than with the the. Sort of very, very widespread communication of knowledge by linguistic communication that we find amongst uh, humans. But still, it seems that uh, knowledge acquired by sense perception and uh, and then preserved by memory, that that is uh, widespread. Well, or at least, let's say, without not to beg the question, the common sense uh, beliefs acquired in those ways and preserved in those ways are widespread amongst animals. And I mean the the advantage of considering the case of uh, animals is that we have no special bias in their favour. Uh, it's not like um, uh, humans assessing human cognition. This is humans assessing non-human uh, cognition. Um, so. <sighs> What what do we say uh, about that? Um, and I think the the natural view here it, is that that for many many species of um, animal, um, they have a lot of knowledge. You know, of of a low level kind um, about their local environments. So, if, if we think, for example, of predators and prey such as cats and mice, um, or tigers and and deer or whatever. Um, so, knowledge of each other's whereabouts and of local geography is a matter of life and death. So, if if you're a mouse, you need to be a very aware to have a lot of, of, you need to have knowledge of um, whether there is any cat around, if there is a cat around, where it is, and so on. And, um, and you also um, need to have knowledge of um, where the holes are that you can run into to escape from the uh, the cat and so on. And the cat also has to have knowledge like uh, that. Um, it needs knowledge of where the mice are, knowledge of where they might run and so on. And of course, we, if we're thinking of domestic cats, then they don't, they don't, their survival doesn't depend on, um, on whether they, they're good at catching mice. But, but if we're thinking of, Big cats in the in the wild, uh, leopards, lions, tigers, and so on. They're, I mean, their their survival depends on their ability to hunt successfully, and similarly with all sorts of uh, other pred predators and prey. And um, if if they have a good awareness of their surroundings, um, that is that they know. About what's going on about them, then that that is crucial both for the the predators and their ability to catch prey, and for the prey in their ability to avoid being caught. Um, and this kind of knowledge is is knowledge that we we um, postulate and attribute to them in order to explain their behaviour. I mean, you know, we can um, when when we're talking about why the the cat is being so cautious and crouching down and so on. It's because 
the, the cat knows that there's a mouse uh, in front of it and you know, it doesn't want to alert the mouse and, uh, and so on. And, you know, and if we... <coughs> we're talking about why the, the, the mouse is running away, we, maybe because it knows that there's a cat after it. Um, and, and so, uh, and of course, th these kinds of uh, explanations, you know, in particular cases can get, get much more detailed and specific about uh, in explaining w just why they, make, they move in one direction rather than another and, and so on. Um, and, if someone suggested that it, we should instead post, postulate um, useful but false uh, beliefs that the the cat and the um, the mouse have, that seems like a much less good explanation. I mean, the, in fact, it's not at all clear what these useful but false beliefs would be that explained uh, their their behaviour, um, and it would also be not at all clear what the what the point of uh, attributing them to the the cat and the and the mouse would uh, would be so the um the natural hypothesis is one which attributes knowledge rather than, than mere belief to the the predators and prey of course i mean there are many particular situations uh, in which the, the the cats and the mice um, have false beliefs, they can be they can be tricked. I mean, they the um, if if the mouse is hiding, the cat may have a false belief that there are no mice uh, around. And if the the um, and if the cat is hiding, then the mice may have the false belief that there's no cat uh, around. But um, but those those false uh, beliefs are specific errors, and in fact, in the examples that I was giving, they're, they're in effect the um, the result of specific um, deceptive strategies or tactics used by the by the other animals to um, to trick the other side into into making a mistake so that as it were where it's generally reliable cognitive ca capacities uh need to be um in some way as it were deceived um so so when we attribute false beliefs to them it, it's really on, on the basis of specific circumstances in a setting where the Perhaps the default is to attribute knowledge, and this is some kind of deviation from it. Um, and someone who just refuses to attribute knowledge to non-human animals seems to be misunderstanding the appropriate um, methodology for attributing uh, mental states that um, the, the the best explanations available of the behavior of non-human animals in many, many cases involves attributing mental states uh, to them. Um, and in fact, um, in animal ethology, quite complex uh, mental states are, are often attributed to the, uh, at least to the higher um, non-human animals. Um, and And this is not as it were, something sentimental or anthropomorphic in the way that we uh, describe them. Um, it, it's something that uh, is evolutionarily plausible um, for the reasons that, that I explained uh, earlier, that uh, on evolutionary grounds, we'd expect that creatures with with minds um, would acquire a lot of knowledge because um, that's what having a mind is is for. Um, and I mean, there wouldn't be much point in um, in have, evolutionary point in having curiosity unless 
um, the thing that it's an appetite for, which is knowledge, was um, was fairly readily uh, available. So, um, and it's also the case that, that that where the best explanation of animal behavior that we have available attributes knowledge, then that's good evidence that that they do know. And indeed, it would be in a way unscientific not to attribute uh, knowledge if um, the effect of not attributing it uh, was that we had to uh, rely on some uh, less good uh, explanation of uh, the animal's uh, behavior. So it seems to me that the overwhelmingly plausible view uh, is that non-human animals have lots of knowledge or, you know, of a, a modest, uh, fairly specific kind, uh, as were a local kind, um, and and that the, the kind of knowledge that that they typically get is is um, is common sense knowledge or at least knowledge acquired uh, by common sense, but animal common sense methods, um, and and then carrying on from that. If many non-human animals have significant knowledge of their environments, it would be quite uh, extraordinary uh, for uh, humans to lack such knowledge. I mean, of course, um, the it, it may well be that that as humans we we do tend to overestimate our species and to think that we're um, cognitively more superior to other animals than we really are. But, but what's utterly implausible is that we are greatly inferior to other species of animal. It seems that, as it were, we're not, we're not at the very least, we're not worse than, uh, than non-human animals uh, in cognitive terms, at, at least overall. I mean, of course, in specific ways, they're better than we are, like they have better sense of smell. Um, and so, it, as it were, just on these kind of evolutionary grounds uh, and in comparison with other animals, it seems that the, um, that the most plausible hypothesis is that we have at least as much knowledge of our environment as non-human animals uh, have of uh, theirs. Uh, and and so because it's this is a kind of common sense um type of of knowledge um it, it's just scientifically extremely plausible that um that human be beings have lots of common sense uh knowledge um and and therefore given the equation of evidence and knowledge um it follows that that common sense is a fallible source of evidence for us, and it's evidence that we can use um, in philosophy as in anything else. Now, of course, that's that's not some kind of um, pure a priori uh, argument um, that uh, the common sense must be uh, a source of uh, of knowledge. It, I mean, there was no transcendental reasoning going on or anything uh, like that. It's um, it's uh, consider these are considerations, as it were, to reassure ourselves that are, if you like, a posteriori are, are based on um, natural science, in particular, on on kind of. A, an evolutionary way of of thinking about uh, what's going on, but that's that's also in line with the picture of philosophy that I've been giving on uh, on which the evidence that we can use uh, in a philosophy is is everything uh, that we know, not not just something that has passed some special test for uh, for being uh, a priori. Um, so. And I should also emphasize that the argument that I've given, it's not a necessary condition for 
having common sense knowledge. I mean, people long before the theory of evolution, uh, people could, um, I mean, had plenty of common sense knowledge. Um, so, I mean, the common sense knowledge is not obtained by thinking about the theory of evolution. It's it's obtained just by using our senses and memory and and so on in common sense ways. Uh, it's rather that the um, we get this common sense uh, knowledge in the common sense ways, but then when we reflect on it and we wonder whether we might be making some error here and that really common sense does not supply us with knowledge, then I think uh, we can reassure ourselves by re reflecting that, in fact, uh, there is very good scientific reason to think that human beings have a, a lot of common sense uh, knowledge. So that's a, a kind of uh, defense of the, the the fallible role of common sense knowledge as a source of evidence with which we can start doing philosophy and that continues to be a source uh, of of evidence for as long as we do philosophy because we continue to uh, to have this common sense knowledge which as knowledge is part of our evidence um so just to, to tell you what's coming in the next lecture, um, there's a natural connection between uh, common sense and the idea of agreement, because uh, since common sense is what's widespread in the given community, uh, it also tends to be agreed. Um, but it also seems uh, that disagreement and disputation plays a very central role in standard uh, philosophical uh, methodology. And so in the next lecture, I'll be talking about the role of disagreement in philosophy. Thank you very much.